<laughs> Good morning to you. It's amazing to me the things we take for granted or that we assume we know. The things that we ignore in our everyday life. The things we go walking right on by or probably don't pay much attention to. One of the things I learned a long time ago when I first got saved was as I was going through the process of dying, I was uh, amazed by the change in perspective I had about all the little things in life that we take for granted. The smells that you don't pay much attention to that you go right on by. Oh, somebody that maybe has a sensitive nose might know what you don't smell. But there's a quality to a person's life that changes as soon as they hear the words, you have cancer or you have an incurable disease or some doctor tells you you're going to die or suddenly you do realize that your time on earth is short. Suddenly it's almost as though the mind goes into a hyperdrive. Drug addicts used to call it being on some kind of drug that heightened awareness. There's an acute perspective of looking at things and seeing the details being aware of them in a way that you weren't before. Even a gentle breeze upon just the very backs of the hairs of your neck or your arms. And you'd be sensitized to that. You'd suddenly be knowledgeable of it. That kind of life is really the appreciative life. It's the kind of life that is aware of those things that are all around us while other people may move on and not notice them at all. The Bible talks about a lot, the hasty people. There are people who are in such a hurry that they miss the little things in life that we take for granted and don't pay much attention to. I know that I taught myself after that experience of dying several times to slow down when I moved into Oregon and then later when I moved into Alaska I began to change my lifestyle to adapt to the environment that I was in and that environment in Oregon at first and then later Alaska especially in the winters in the bush taught me that you can't be in a hurry because it could kill you. <laughs> it's funny how that works. But you began to understand how to look at things. You began to see things in a different way by slowing down and evaluating more with your mind, with your heart, and with your spirit those things that were all around you. When God spoke to me the first time, he simply said, he spoke quite a bit, you know, I mean, we had a conversation and that was pretty amazing. I mean, I was confronted by Jesus and he spoke to me. I was affronted by Jesus, meaning that he asked me questions that challenged me, you know, he asked me one question that challenged me directly, you know, and I was like shocked because I, I didn't know quite how to answer and I fumbled I mean I at that point in time thought I was pretty you know quote unquote Jesus freakish enough to be spiritual and when you deal with someone who's coming from a different perspective a quality of character your conversation isn't like what we do with our flippant way of communication in America it was directive. It was to the heart, and I was cut to the quick. It was interesting, and it changed my life forever. And every time that I think about it, I, I get a smile, but I also remember <laughs> very clearly <laughs> what it was like talking to Jesus. 
Now, through the years, it's been, with the help of the Holy Spirit, adapted to me in different ways. It's, you know, sometimes talking to the Father is different than talking to the Son, and talking to the Son different than the Spirit making known Himself or speaking to me. And I find it fascinating, this life that we live, that we assume this kind of existence, you know, you and I communicating, is the only one there is. Because it's easier for me to look at you and you to look at me than it is to have that unusual communication with the Father, with the Son, and with the Spirit. Now it is interesting that the Bible says we can have that. As a matter of fact, the Bible, the, the, the whole sum of it says we're supposed to have a personal relationship with God and most of the time Christianity is trying to teach you not to have a personal relationship with God because they're afraid you might go off on a tangent or you might get become a wacko or a weirdo or have some kind of experience like a Joan of Arc or something that might cost you your life. It's true, it might. <laughs> Following Jesus is never guaranteed to keep you alive. <laughs> Just ask the disciples. But one of the things that I've begun to incorporate into my, my relationship with my wife that we enjoy now, one of the things that we've begun to make a part of our life, especially on Sundays, because I'm so busy on Sundays with three services and Sunday night service, and just doing things that I want to I wanna get out there so that people will understand that they whether they make it in the rapture or whether they go on into great tribulation, that God is with them, that if God is with you, it doesn't matter whether you live or whether you die, you're going to heaven, you're going home soon. You'll make it one way or another. God will use your life in some capacity to bring you to the place He wants you to be. And one of the things we started in our life was to slow down, because I, I shared with her, when I finally had the chance to, we, we took what we call a picnic. You know the old idea of a picnic. You know, you take a basket, like Yogi Bear, and you take Boo Boo Bear along, you know, and you have Yogi and Boo Boo, <laughs> my wife and I. <laughs> but you take a picnic, you know, not too serious, but not too, you know, simple. And you just go someplace where nobody else is, a park maybe, and wind down. Detox your systematic hurriness, your tyranny of the urgent, as it used to be called. You begin to wait, be still, be calm. As it were, in the old days, there used to be a time where they said, wait for the sunrise, like we're doing now getting together in the morning before the sunrise and waiting on the sunrise used to be a quality of Christianity that was a part of development of that meditation part of life that we don't like to talk about in the West because we're scared of what they do in the East with meditation. Now, Jesus getting up before the sun spent long hours before the sunrise talking to his father, enjoying that fellowship, that quality of intimacy. We use the word fellowship not really the way that God intends it, we use it the way we intend it, but the intimacy of the relationship that Jesus had is the quality of what he was doing when he spent that time in the morning alone with God. That's what fellowship really is. Uh, fellowship would have been in the oldish English word was to live with and to be a part of someone's life not just a you know minute by minute or I got an hour for you or I got a day for you or I'll meet you once a week that's not really fellowship fellowship was to become a fellow to be a part of an incorporated being of existence and Spending that time on a picnic on Sunday afternoon, my wife and I got a chance to slow down. 
And as we did, I got a chance to speak with her of things that I know that I don't do what I used to do. And that is to begin to bring myself into the same pace that God is in, my Father. You see, my Father in heaven goes so slow, we, you and I, often run far ahead of him. And he's not behind us because he knows we run so far and so fast ahead that he just waits until we catch up with him, so to speak. Much like a father watches a little child go running off. Have you ever noticed a little little child that finally has got their, their legs under them? You know, they've learned how to walk and now they've learned how to run. And sure enough, if you don't run after them, guess what happens? They'll split. <laughs> They're gone. Two minutes, not even that, 30 seconds and poof. They are down the block, out the door, and all over the place. They're running throughout the neighborhood because they just little legs are pumping and they're gone they don't know where they're going they're just running that's a lot like what uh, our father in heaven sees us as little children running we're not very good at being still we're not very good at going slow we're not very good at just appreciating the moment or living in the day one of the things that Utah Vidivo and Vidivo Church and, you know, the word for Woods Cross is, I want to remind you that sometimes blindness occurs through our own choices. We choose to miss the checks and balances. We choose to ignore the warning signs. We choose to run the red lights. And lately, as much of the news has reported, people get killed because of it. If we would simply slow down, it doesn't matter what your job requires, God can change time. If we would simply be still, doesn't matter what your workload is like, you'll find that God changes the ability and the capability in that moment of time that in what we call quantum string mechanics, time can stretch. Now, it depends upon the perspective of the person that's in it and the perspective of the person that's above it or outside of it because time is dimensional. And because it's dimensional, God, existing outside of time, can use something that we call quantum string mechanics. And it's a mathematical kind of way of looking at the perspective of physics and realizing that time isn't as though it were from one continuity to another, as though it goes from hour to hour to minute to minute. No, that only goes that way based upon what we see in the universe with the planets and the stars. But what if there was something beyond the planet and the stars and we took an Einsteinian or an Einstein way of looking at the universe and said, but if light only travels at a certain speed, what happens when light slows down? What happens when the physics that we think is so set in stone doesn't operate the way we think it does, like time, then suddenly there's lots of time because our perspective has changed. We base our workload a lot on just the sunrise and the sunset. That's really how we base most of our work. So God, our Father, being outside of that kind of time, He can be ahead of you at the same time that he could be behind you as you're running around. Because if you had little children, you know how and where they're usually going to run to, and you kind of cut them off at the pass. You know what they're going to do, so you kind of build boxes around their little running ability, and you keep them safe by protecting them and keeping them in their little playground or the little watch area that you keep an eye on them when they're in that running stage. Later, you might speak to them and tell them not to do something, and they, they then learn not to run off or run away or run, run, run. But they learn how to play in another way instead of running. That's what my wife and I did on Sunday. Instead of just being about, you know, church and sitting and listening and worshiping, we spent quality time with our Father. We 
took the moments, because we're doing that on Sundays now, to add that to part of our day of celebration of knowing and being intimate with God our Father and His Son Jesus and being led of the Spirit to be still and know God intimately. And as we did, we were amazed at the difference, you know, the blades of grass, the the bees, you know, that are in the, the heather, you know, and, and in the, I forget what she called it, some plants that are there. And we were high up, I mean, it's interesting living where we do, you know, in Woods Cross and Bountiful is that when you go up the mountain, you know, you start off at 5,000 feet already, so as you go up the mountain, you're even higher up. So we sat in the shade and we brought chairs to sit in the sun and we laid out a blanket, you know, and I brought a picnic basket and I brought the camera just in case we record. We'll be recording later, but we wanted to demonstrate for ourselves and practice it so that next Sunday it'll be easier. But besides all those practical things, we ate. Not saying much, not, you know, going through some checklist of things we need to speak about or talk about, not going through some, you know, put on some earbuds or put on some radio and make some noise. But we were there all along because most people are gone away into their church day, you know, they they have their quiet time and they, they go either to church on the morning session or the night session, if they're Mormon, or, or they're Christians, they go through their morning routines, you know, whether either at a early service or a you know, later service. But however you look at it, they're not in the park. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's where I am. Yeah, I have church in the park. But spending that time, I got a chance to explain to her some of what I teach a lot about. And I, I, I learned it from the Holy Spirit series that we've done. And uh, we're bringing that back out, and you'll see it soon. You know, Living Gracefully is the Grace series. We have a Holy Spirit series, too. But when you slow down, you'll notice, like, tonight or today, this morning, I'm watching this turtle dove that's sitting on the roof, and he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him, and he's cooing, and I'm talking to you. And I know he's speaking to me. And I don't know what he's saying, because I don't spend the time to learn that language much less the birds that sing early in the morning. We don't bother trying to investigate what are they saying or what are they doing. Those are the lessons that God will teach you if you learn, believe it or not, to slow down. Maybe if we appreciated the things that God was doing, we would learn something from the Spirit of God that would go beyond our comprehension and give us a better awareness of what life really is all about. And it's not about what you can see, touch, and feel. There's more to life than just the things that are passing away and the image thereof. There's obviously more to reality than just sitting here and now I'm watching two turtle doves sitting together. And both of them are looking at me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But there's more to life and, and you're day-to-day -day living than what you're doing when you're busy in a hurry. If you'll slow down, if you'll step back, if you'll be still, if you'll silence the rush and quit hyping yourself with either worship music or hyping yourself with wind up in order to get ready for work, with getting wound up in order to get the work done, with getting you know, kind of hyper and hasty in your words and in your thoughts and in your deeds. The thing I love about Chuck Smith's tapes is that Chuck Smith's tapes were always taught in such a way that people say, I like Chuck Smith what he teaches, but I wish he would hurry up. Well, Chuck Smith, in his way of talking, was partially a technique, but partially a reality of knowing the words that are flowing out of his mouth are something that's coming from the heart. And after having spent time with God, you slow down rather than speed up. The Father doesn't do anything in a hurry. As a matter of fact, you'll find that almost all of your issues in life are going to stem from being in a hurry or making a quick decision. 
we used to say, you know, sleep on it, you know, and the old expression was that if you slept on it, it gave you time for your mind and your body and your soul and your spirit to connect and you could make a better decision that way, but you should never make a quick decision, a snap decision. Even though American society is the opposite, they want you to make a quick decision. I say no, don't do it. <laughs> As they would say, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of God says. But in the morning, when you have that opportunity to be still, get up early. You know, if you want to be hasty, well, you know, do your little hasty part. But then take a time to set aside a part of your morning to wind down, to wait, to be still, to be quiet, to be silent. To look, to wait, to watch, to see the Lord. If you don't want to know God and you don't want to get intimate with the Father, then just be in a hurry. Because that hasty people that we talked about throughout all of scriptures, there is nothing in the Bible that says anything good about a hasty people. There is nothing that says to be in a hurry. There is nowhere in the scriptures that it says you should rush, you should be anxious, you should wind up, or you should get hyped up. Nowhere. Matter of fact, if anything, we're told a lot about endurance and overcoming. And the way you really do a lot of times in enduring and overcoming is by waiting on the Lord. Thus shall you Thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, with your loins girded, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Well, praise the Lord, I guess I was wrong about one thing. <laughs> the Lord's Passover. Although we'll explain that some other time. <laughs> It's, it's not the same kind of haste. It means being made aware that you're leaving in a hurry. In other words, God could call you away. So be prepared is what we would say in using this word. But, hey, I like God's sense of humor. God doesn't say to do anything in a haste. And guess what? You shall eat it in haste. So, arise you and depart, for this is not your rest. Here have we no continuing city but we do seek one that is to come. There remains therefore a rest to the people of God. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that will wait for their Lord, whom when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open up to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I press forward to the mark for the prize of the high calling of Jesus in Christ, God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. Girding up your loins and being prepared is what the word is talking about. The end of the world has come. It is obvious. There's no question about it. There's no debating it. There's no arguing or trying to say you have 10 more years. You don't. It's pretty obvious that you have probably less than five years. Maybe even less than that for some of you. But even with less than five years left, God has been saying all along, be ready. Now he's warning more so, be prepared. Because if you're so wrapped up in the doing, you might miss if God's calling. And if God's calling and then he does go to the marriage supper and leaves you behind, he's still coming again for you. He's still going to say, hey, 
I'm going to save you in the Great Tribulation period, even though you may be left behind. But you have to be ready. You have to be watching. You have to be prepared. You have to be sober-minded. You have to know that I didn't leave you behind because you're so evil or so wicked. I simply left you behind because that's my will, doing the will of the Father. And if the Father hasn't brought you to my wedding, you're coming as my servant. Praise the Lord. So, don't get yourself too caught up into being snatched away and taken away because some will. I would pray that God would go out into the highways and byways and save those to the uttermost, those that maybe are prepared for that which most of us that are religious or in some way knowledgeable of God know what's going to happen. I would think that it would be better to save those that don't know and save those that are not prepared than to take us who are really technically already warned that following Jesus will cost your life. Now I know there's a lot of warning in Christians that think every warning in Christian that they call true or they call whatever they call them is going to be raptured. Well, the Bible doesn't say that, but that's okay. The day after the rapture, my perspective is that if I'm here, I'm going to be sharing with you the same thing I'm telling you today. Some will be taken, some will be left behind. If you've been left behind, you have work to do. If you've already been taken, you have praises to do up in heaven. Enjoy it. Praise the Lord. My prayer for you, Woods Cross and Bountiful, and anyone else that's listening or watching, is that God would spare you. You know, God knows I'd rather have you, you know, as a friend of the bridegroom. I know Jesus, you know, now I'm a friend of the bridegroom, so, hey, I'm praying for you. If you, if you can't make it, you know, and if you can't take it, then please go, you know, be, be prepared now and be taken away. If God spares me, I love the idea of being taken and going to see the, the wedding supper of the Lamb, that I have done my, my work now, I have finished the course, I have run the race, I have done everything I was told to do. I hope you do too. But if you don't and you haven't, you will. It's that simple. It's not because God hates you or God's beating you up or God's sparing you from the wrath to come. The wrath to come is going upon the whole earth. And you pray to be counted worthy to be spared that hour of temptation. For some it's just an hour, for others it's three and a half years or seven. Whichever way you want to look at that. You know, peace going on is a trying time because people are being deceived during those first three and a half years of peace. And then when the Great Tribulation starts, in the midst thereof, it gets bad. But still, God never said He wasn't going to save people. In the letters to seven churches, as a matter of fact, He said, Blessed are you if you overcome. Do this. So do it. <laughs> but learning to not be hasty in your words, learning not to be hasty in your actions, Learning to be, as we've just read, hasty in the celebration of the Passover simply means to have your clothes on. You know, always be ready to walk away from your job or your life or whatever may be that's hindering you from following Jesus. If God says, follow me, you go. Just like he told his disciples, follow me, and they got up and left. They walked away. Some of them left their jobs, some of them left their families, some of them left many things behind. Some of them, after having given up their families, their homes, their houses, and their neighbors, and their relatives, and everything, once they did see what they had given up for, those relatives discovered Jesus, and then some of them got back their house or their home, or got some other way of being blessed, because God's no debtor to any man. He'll give you back if you really think he owes you something. Oh, he'll give it to you. You may not like it because those are temporary things. But seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that means to be ready at all times to leave all of this behind. So get out of debt. Don't be in debt. Forgive people immediately. Extend grace to everyone. 
love the brethren, but love the sinner also. Love the world that God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. It's not about standing up for righteousness or trying to think that you're the one called to declare somehow, oh, I've got to be the one to tell sinners they're sinners. No, you don't. God's going to use angels in heaven to do that for you. He sent his Holy Spirit to do that. He didn't send you. You're not the one to convict people of their sins at all. You're here as a testimony of Jesus, of his mercy, of his love, and of his grace. If you're doing something else, good luck. I hope it works out for you. You're probably going to go into great tribulation to be used of that gift that you say you have. Because if you're trying to play the Holy Spirit, God will step out of the way and let you. And that'll happen in the Great Tribulation. You will be, while the Holy Spirit is gone, that calling you, say you've got, you know, to be some kind of convictor of sin, some kind of example of light, some kind of preacher of righteousness, some kind of, I need to confront people. Well, you will. You'll just do it in the Great Tribulation. Sorry, that's where you're going to be used as, and you kind of participated in that, and God helped you along with it. You chose, you goes. You know what I mean? I'd rather pray that if it's at all possible, you and I be spared those things. And if that means that we have to slow our lifestyle down, to maybe reread what we thought we knew, or recommit our lives, or rededicate our way or maybe on a Sunday be still to begin to have fellowship with our Father which is in heaven then maybe that's what you ought to do maybe today even sometimes you know my wife knows this and it was like I showed her even when I had my job it's like hey, if God doesn't tell me to go to work I'm not going if God tells me to go to work I go to work if God says wait I wait because I could go to work and a gas main could blow up. I could be on my way to work and I could get hit by a car. I could be on my way to go do those things that I thought I'm supposed to automatically do. And if God didn't tell me to do, I might be doing them without Him helping me, or dare I say, protecting me from the world. And it might be my time to go and like that. In the twinkling of an eye, my body dies, but I go to be with the Lord. This day as you seek to follow the Lord, don't be hasty. Don't be wasting your life away. Look for the signs of His coming. Look for the signs of His calling. Look for the intimate details that He's going to reveal to you today of who He is and how He speaks to you every day as you walk in the word as you walk in his way but as you slow down and let God do it his way in his timing and in his pace slow down it's not that big a deal it's just 